Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I testify that there is no deity to worship except Allah, and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace and prayers be on him, is his slave servant and messenger. And I begin by and with the name of Allah, the compassionate and merciful. I ask Allah to guide my heart and my tongue and my hands, and I seek refuge in him from misleading anybody and being misled, and from deceiving anyone and being deceived. But again, some of you may wonder, well, who is it? And the message is more important than the messenger. Earlier today, less than two hours before I recorded this, I saw uh, a video put out by one of our sisters in Saudi Arabia. Um, Abir Sinder is her name. And um, she is a black Saudi. I don't know which city she lives in and it's not my business. Um, but she does makeup tutorials. And I'm gonna go on record right now as saying that um, I'm not in her corner because she does the makeup tutorials showing the application of makeup uh, with her hair out and that sort of thing. As a Muslim, I would never tell a Muslim woman, yeah, do that and then tell her to take off the hijab, but it's not my business anyway. But I'm in her corner as I have been, when she confronts racism and colorism. And this is something uh, that's necessary. I must be in her corner. And the reason is because the bottom line is that she's right for being against this racism and this colorism. And the people who would oppose her are wrong. Most of what I'm going to say is really going to be for the information of everybody, but it is directly addressed to Saudi and its culture. Um, I did not understand everything that she said in Arabic. I understood a lot of it. And in a nutshell, she said something that I had mentioned earlier, or I tried to mention to a friend of mine. She said uh, something about people saying, or you're beautiful, but you're black. Or you're black, but you're beautiful. Now, the word she said was only. But in that context, it's used as but. Uh, especially if you put beautiful and then you say just she's black. It's like saying she's beautiful and the only thing, the only drawback is that she's black. Uh, the idea is that black and beautiful don't go together. And I want to say that this is a nationally, culturally accepted idea in Saudi Arabia and in many parts of the Arab world. I give credit to Jordan for one thing. In Jordan, they at least understand why black folks find each other attractive. Even though many Jordanians would like to marry a woman as pale as they can find, Jordanians generally do understand if a black man finds black women attractive, that's normal even if he himself, the Jordanian, finds very, very pale-skinned women attractive. At the very least, he does not knock uh, a black man that likes black women. No Jordanian has ever said to me, why do you only like black women? No Sudanese, of course, has, has asked that question. They understand it too, but then again, it's a black country. And contrary to what we may think, the Sudanese do not mind being black. <laughs> They're okay with it. But the Saudis, and I've lived in Saudi, so I know. The Saudis, you're not going to like what I'm going to say about your culture. And this does not mean that I walk around with the personal hatred for everyone that is Saudi. That's not the case at all. But the fact remains that certain nasty things about your backward subhuman culture need to be said. You're not the only ones. I left a country, the country I was born and raised in. The United States is also backwards and subhuman in many ways. So I'm not going to exempt the U.S. simply because I was born and raised there. 
I'm more proud to be an African than I am to be an American. And I can tell you that Africa is so diverse that you will find a backward culture uh, uh, being practiced by a group of people that live right next to another group of people that are quite advanced and quite understanding. However, because many people in Africa are more mixed than what we think, at least in West Africa, yes, people are actually more tribally mixed than what we think they are. Many people in West Africa have grandparents that are from a tribe other than the tribe that individual is from. Therefore, many people have learned to live together. And so this is, um, uh, this has made it very rare to just find a culture that is just backwards as hell and the people are holding on to it for dear life and biting it with their molars. Biting it the way a pit bull clamps on to something. You don't typically find that. The more backwards a culture is, the less the people are really sticking to it once they've met people from somewhere else. Generally speaking, what I'm saying is that I have found from West Africans that I've met that the good ideas spread more quickly and the bad ideas get left behind. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, let me just be honest about what the hell I'm saying. No, it's not like that. The bad ideas are spreading quickly and that's why cigarettes are legal in this country and why they sell so damn much. If I invested in cigarettes in this country, I'd be rich. And I maybe should do that. I probably should. You want to kill yourselves? Hell, let me just get rich while you do that to yourselves. And I'll just come and get some of that money. Because you don't listen when people advise you. What else? Why is it that drifting is a part of the culture? And teenagers are killing themselves left and right. Because Saudis take on bad habits more easily than they take on good habits. Why is it that Fusa is not known? The classical Arabic is not known. You want to know why? It's simple. I'm going to tell the rest of the world what's really going on. If proper Arabic is spoken out in public by somebody that is not a newscaster, the people will laugh at him for not talking specifically Saudi slang. That sounds like some, some familiar nigger business to those of us who grew up in the States. You got people of that teenage mindset that don't mentally become adults and they laugh at someone else for doing something positive. But we had to be broken by centuries of oppression for this to happen. Saudi didn't have to be. No, they just, it just is already there. Cheating is the normal way for the majority of students to pass from level to level to level in their education. That is the norm. Studying? No. You got students who study, but it's rare. And they, and they have to share and oftentimes get less or lower grades than the students who simply cheat their way through everything. But where's the justice in that? There is no justice in it. This is what is so sad about it. Oh, that's not all. It gets worse. You see, I have been in the country for three years and I have uh, debated with many people about their racist views that they did not know were racist. And they argued and argued and argued. And oftentimes the more wrong they are, the more they interrupt you instead of shutting the hell up and listening while you tell them you're backwards, you're effed up, you need to change this. And as a matter of fact, since you can insult black people so freely, even though you're not saying that they're subhuman, you, since you can insult black people's freedom by calling us slaves or uh, insinuate that black women are naturally less beautiful than every other race of women on the planet, let me hear you insult white people and they can't do it. Oh no, they don't let you even try to get that far. That sentence I told you just now, you can almost never finish talking to a, especially a better one, Saudi. And they're the ones who are the most proud of being the most original of Saudis. You can't finish a sentence because when they're wrong and the stupider their ideas are, the more they interrupt you. No. You've got to tell them sometimes, you effed up and really you don't deserve this land. You got to tell them very nasty things at times to shock them into silence. And then and to their credit, they do accept correction better than whites do. Once you get them to stop interrupting. 
to their credit. And that's one of the redeeming values that could very well project, propel them forward in their Islam and in the matters of the life of this world. But they can't stop interrupting sometimes till you walk off or maybe put a gun in their mouth. I mean, there are some of them that are so bad you have to put a gun in their mouth just to get them to listen to why they offended somebody. They're backwards. And I don't think the punishment of God is coming upon you fast enough. I was in an airport once on the African continent. I was in Northern Africa getting ready to fly back to Saudi. And I just happened to meet a Saudi coming when I came out of the prayer room at the airport. And he asked what I did for a living. I told him I taught English. He asked me where, and I said, I teach in Saudi Arabia. And he asked me how I liked it, and I told him straight up, um, I don't like it anymore. Um, the students are mostly a bunch of cheaters, and they're hypocrites and liars. And they're not mean, they're not violent. They could be the nicest people, but they won't be honest. And when they get caught cheating, so no, I don't like it that much anymore. Um, and he told me he was Saudi. Well, I suspected he might have been anyway, but that didn't stop me. And I said to him, well, if you're from Saudi, then you know better than I do about how they cheat because you grew up there. And if you didn't cheat, then you had to fight your classmates who did. You know the game. And he said, yeah, that is true. And he introduced me to his friend. We went and we ate later on. And his, ironically, this man had nappy hair, black blood, obvious and evident. And his friend... Um, look like what we might stereotype the Arab to look at. His hair was straight, in other words. He was a, a brown-skinned person or a, a bronze-skinned person with straight hair. And when the talkative man with the, the beady, beady, nappy hair um, asked me um, if I was married, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm married, and uh, I mean, I'm leaving my wife, but for the meantime, I'm married. And he said, well, why don't you marry a Saudi? And I said, well, I'm not opposed to Saudis because of their nationality. But, you know, most Saudis don't want any of their family members marrying a foreign man. Um, plus, I myself would only marry a black Saudi, and I don't know what percentage of the population is black. And he said, why? I said, because black women are more attractive in my view. That's why. Why not? He was surprised. He asked another question. I can't remember what it was. But he asked out of shock. He didn't hate me. He didn't think I was stupid per se. But he, he was so surprised to hear a man say that he preferred black women. And I said to him, hey, man, we're black. What is the problem? And his friend who would not be necessarily considered black in the U.S., except maybe by black Americans, he said to his friend, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, he's black. He likes black women. You know, we've, uh, it's normal for people to like their own. <laughs> Japanese men and Japanese women like each other a lot of times. What's so strange about that? I'm going to tell you this, Saudi. You're not violent in your racism. You don't kill in your racism. The problem with you, Saudi, is the fact that you are Muslim. You're not supposed to have the racism in the first goddamn place. And you cannot sit up and say that beauty standards are just personal preference. No, no. See, a beer cinder is addressing beauty standards. That is a problem. However, personal taste is the right of the individual. The issue at hand is that you as a society hate critical thinking and you hate analytical thinking, forget the word critical. If that's a bad word, even though we don't mean it like that in English, use the word analytical thinking. You still hate that so much in your culture that you've made yourself backwards ideologically. You hate analytical thinking to the point, Saudis, that you don't ask yourself, when did a personal preference become a cultural bias? You didn't ask yourself, how did 
how is it a personal preference if the entire effing culture has it? And how did the entire effing culture come to prefer the image of the oppressor's women over the image of the women that are native and normal to that region? In other words, why is it that most of you would jump over Saudi women to marry a European woman specifically, even though they are associated with colonizing the peninsula? Here's the reason why you would do it, because you have an inferiority complex, because you don't like analytical thinking, you don't support it, and therefore you have made yourselves artificially stupid. You weren't born stupid, you made yourselves that way. But because so many of you did this, you now have a stupid culture and there's no polite or nice way to put it. The further anybody gets away from the cities, the more conservative the people become culturally and religiously, but converse, but the problem is that the stupider they become. To the point they can't even practice the religion correctly because they're just too goddamn stupid. It is against the religion of God to hold the view that the oppressor is preferable to the victim in any way, form, or fashion. Many of you had no clue of this. My advice to you, Sister Abir Sinder, is to keep doing what you're doing, but don't just challenge the society's beauty standards being pro-white and anti-black. It goes deeper than that. And as a matter of fact, the society has no business seeing you without your hijab on because your beauty is more than what they deserve to see. And when I say your beauty, I mean with no blonde wig on your head, sister. With your hair being just as dark and as nappy as God could have possibly made it. That is so beautiful that the society does not deserve to see it. But understand this, Abir. Keep doing what you're doing, but confront them for racist ideas they have regarding any and everything, period. And not just that. Tell other black Saudis, Abir, don't think for a second that they're less beautiful to look at than non-black folks because they're black. Don't think for a second that, even, that they are anything less than the originators of mankind. You, you all are the, the grandfathers and the grandmothers of all of humanity. You're the original people. You look like Adam. You look like Eve. Peace be to them. Don't think for a second anything less. So if you were black in Saudi Arabia, that means obviously you came from Africa sometime since the last ice age. And you Muslim too? Oh man. Don't think nothing less of yourself. Don't let anybody tell you anything like that. Don't let them try to act like it's normal. It is not normal for people to feel this way. That they're somehow less than. And don't let anybody call you a slave. And if they do, don't let them say, oh, we're all slaves of God. Bilal was black. I'm not a racist. If they call you a slave, a beer, and tell the rest of the black Saudis this. If they call you a slave, call them a terrorist and see how they like it. And if anybody ever puts their hands on you violently in a way they would not have done to a non-black Saudi, beat the hell out of them and put them in the hospital in self-defense. Do not tolerate one lick, one inch, one hair's width of discrimination against yourselves. You deserve this peninsula more than they do because the first people in the Arabian Peninsula were black. Everything else came later. This isn't even their land. They're just guests. This whole peninsula belongs not to the Saudis who call themselves white. No, it belongs to you, the black ones. If they say that they brought you here, it still belongs to you because their own ancestors looked like you, period. And if you don't believe me, Abir Sender, tell other black Saudis that they need to listen to Dawood Walid. He spells it D-A-W-U-D-W-A-L-I-D. That's how he spells his name. Daud Wali. He needs to be listened to by black Saudis. Habib Akande. He spells his name H A B double E B. And Akande H, I'm sorry, A K A N D E. <laughs> Tell the black Saudis they need to listen to Habib Akande. Daud Wali. They need to listen to Malcolm X speeches. They need to know more than what they've been knowing. They need to know about Malcolm X. 
And frankly, they need to know what the hell is wrong with white people in Europe, Western Europe. They need to know. See, Eastern Europeans could be Muslim or Christian. And the Muslims aren't the problem in Eastern Europe. No. And they are as white as it gets. But they need to know what's wrong with the Arabs who call themselves white and why that's wrong and why that's stupid and why it's dangerous. They need to know these things. Because believe you me, around the rest of the world, anti-blackness is global. And unfortunately, black folks are not all the same, which is OK. That's fine. But we unfortunately, we don't realize that we're going to have to lean on each other and unite in a, in a type of black nationalism, not because we Muslims believe in any racial nationalism, but because the rest of the world is being successfully brainwashed to force us into this option to protect ourselves. Tell them, Abir Sinder. And if they can't stand what you're saying and they want to fight with you about it then they can come discuss it with me. They will love you after they hear what I have to say about them. Because in my mind, you call yourself a Muslim, but you got one bit of anti-black opinion, you ain't a Muslim. You're a hypocrite, kafir, dog disbeliever. And you're barely human. Oh, and by the way, for the record, to the Saudi Bedouins, your culture's backwards. Allah doesn't like your culture. And he said it in Surah Toba, 97, 98. The minority of you that are righteous, y'all cool, y'all as good as gold with me too. And you're the ones Allah's talking about in, in, chap, in uh, verse 99 of uh, chapter 9, Surah Toba. But if you fall in to verse 97 or 98, I don't even consider you Muslim. I consider you a hypocrite, straight up. You know which one you are after you read them verses. So I'm just putting that out there straight up. Saudi Bedouins who practice the Bedouin culture above Islam. I don't pray behind you. I count you as a hypocrite Kafir. Straight up. And you probably going to call me a hypocrite Kafir because I don't forgive or count everybody as being equal. And I actually count people as being unequal inferior or superior, not based on their race, but based on their views of racial equality. And you may think I'm a hypocrite calf because of that. Well, yeah, we can make talk free on each other. And we can stand in front of God on judgment day and we can see who's able to best defend their position. When I say to Allah that I don't believe in racial superiority or inferiority, but that individuals become inferior because they can't comprehend the, the equality of black people with everybody else. And that's my problem. I can defend that position. You can't defend your position if you can't understand black equality. That's what racial equality means. It actually also means that if all the races in the world are willing to gang up on one race, they become inferior to the race they ganged up on because they were willing to gang up on them. That's also what it means. I'm simply saying that. I'm not saying that any race is created inferior or superior. But many of you will not even listen to this and you will interrupt and you will turn this off prematurely and you will form your opinion. Many of you have already turned off uh, this recording before you finished hearing me get this far in it. You will automatically assume that because I won't tolerate your views of black as being less than that I'm somehow a racist. No. Uh-uh. But will you be able to stand in front of God on judgment day and defend your position? So all your little extra prayers and extra acts of worship that you perform while in the back of your mind it was anti-blackness you wouldn't confront, you can get them deeds to me. Because I'm going to accept every last one that Allah is willing to transfer to my account on the day of judgment. I don't count you. I don't consider you as deserving them anyway. I mean, what are 20 prayers? What good are 20 prayers a day? 10 prayers a day instead of the five if you can't understand that Allah made people equal. And that the first people he created were black. When you tell me that the name of Muslim should not take the name Adam... But you take Ali because for black people to name themselves Adam is, is actually racist. Did you know that Ali was described as being the same complexion as Bilal? May Allah be pleased with both of them. No, you didn't know that. 
But if I drew a picture of Ali as being black, many of you would not have a problem with me drawing a picture of Ali, although I wouldn't do that. You'd have a problem with me drawing a picture of him as being black. But that's how the Hadith describes him. I mean, y'all said Bilal was black. Well, you know, Ali was black. And he was related to the Prophet. So what does that tell you about the Prophet's ancestry? Peace and prayers be to him. A light-skinned man with black ancestors. Well, that wouldn't be the first time that happened. That's actually quite normal. But what this means, though, is that if you're going to sit up and say that it is disbelief to say that the prophet was black, I'm telling you that light skin, but black, gene uh, you know, genetically back black, but having light skin. I'm telling you, it would dawn near be disbelief to say that he had no black blood in him. I mean, if the hadith about Ali's complexion is true. And by the way, there's a hadith where in Omar. May Allah be pleased with him. Umar ibn Khattab said he swore by Allah that Muhammad Wasallam did not describe Jesus as being uh, very light skinned or white or red white like what they used red to mean back then. He swore by Allah that these were not the case. You see, there are multiple hadiths about how Jesus is described, alayhi salam. But Umar, some say he was, you know, a, 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 a dark brown. In some narrations, he was uh, quite pale-skinned. But Omar, peace, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, had a hadith. He narrated, wherein he swore by Allah that Muhammad Wasallam did not say that Jesus was a uh, uh, reddish-white or very light-skinned. Didn't say it. What does this tell you? This, I'm starting to wonder if it was possible of course, every nation had their prophets, but I'm beginning to wonder if Allah ever named a prophet that did not have black blood in him. I'm beginning to think that that never happened. Not that none existed, but that none of them are ever named. I mean, look at Hajar. She was an Egyptian, and mind you, I don't have any affection for modern day Egypt at all. Like, no affection. It's a negative affection. I'd rather live in Darul Harb than to live in Egypt. No, it's like that. It's that bad. And part of it is because of their racial views. But hey, look. Hajar was from Egypt. Ancient Egypt. That's black Egypt. And they themselves came from Kush, which is in today's Sudan. So Hajar, the mother of Ismail, was black. So if Ibrahim wasn't black, alayhi salam, then his children were definitely black. Especially Ismail. So if Ismail is the father of the Arabs, then what does that tell you about who the Arabs are? So for you all to have these anti-black notions, even if it's just about beauty, for you to entertain anti-black notions, that's self-hatred. And for you to entertain them after you know what I've told you just now, well, that's kufr and hypocrisy as far as I'm concerned. I hope this message has been helpful. Salam alaikum.